Uganda has been fragmented into 112 districts now in the hope that this move will establish availability, accessibility, cost and utilization of services to recipients. Just a few kilometers from the capital, education, health, agriculture, infrastructure, water and sanitation services have not reached the people. We spoke with some residents of Kamuli still suffering from jiggers in this century. Am I now going to say that I'm a robot? I'm a member of the village of the village. I'm a member of the village of the village. To Kumiriza, to Kuviriza Vantu, Okuba Linkinga Kumaduarido, no Kugambanga, to Rigaza Queen Avantu Babe, no Bulam, Gabalam. Aye, Obuzibu to a gun, Auntie Avantu by Fabet to Colam Emirim, Balum Bibuino, Malaria. Fadio Kuchibonanga, Echid is a Malarion Oku Tigomia in Avantu by. Tibafunia Mukisa, Kufunabu Timba. Chavant, a e chintu chino chivale tere no wavu. Kuba Burisawa, Badia Mbaja, Kuidandava, Mesuda. At it wava no buzibun to Muluka Guno to the right right of your government. Avantu was a look with the services, a da, doverere. Chavant gave a denda, but ambling and don't pamfu. At all only batu keju, and gay dagala. Wireo by the Rao. The government in Jacobiro Mulanga. Unti a chintwaki soca a tulo zeku. Ngamukutu loza quick is waxing a wound. Cha, Mosuda. But of Nirobu timber. By the Batu Gavide. A chocubidi. Avantu loco vanti. Okuluala kununama dry roga to Mazeque sent. Ne wetusula. Tulemeri ruo kulongo sawo. Chaba anti nemvunza ditandi so kulumba abantu. Mungeri nge yokale government we tulooza ku. At least tuba anti tusobola omusu dati guli kutulumba ino sobolo kusavinga wa isente. Tuwako levi ntuwe vindi. Such scenarios indicate that it's no longer possible to run a centralized government because the services do not reach the recipients. Budget allocations has improved the different sectors, but the delivery of public services continues to deteriorate. Why the mismatch? We debate the delivery of services. is turning around Uganda, the alternative policy series. Coming up on the program. But this idea, which is a big mindset problem of Uganda, that for you to, prov to finance a service, you must provide it, must be abandoned, and must be abandoned yesterday. The, the cement floor had collapsed, so we used to smear with cow dung to stop the jiggers. Uh, up to now, the kids study in the same classroom broke. Uh, basically, we have hired fertile Ugandan women or perhaps active. You're watching Turning Around Uganda, the alternative policy series. My name is Simon Kasiatin. Now with the advent of the structural adjustment policies about 20 years ago, the government of Uganda embarked on systematic and deliberate decentralization and privatization. But 20 years down the road, none of these policies seems to have delivered on the delivery of the public good. And the question is, why? To discuss this this evening, we're joined by Mr. Godbert Mushabe, a social entrepreneur, a lawyer, and researcher who has carried out extensive research in this regard. He's also the executive director of the Advocates for Coalition for Development and Environment. I'm also joined by a member of parliament, leaning to the yellow side, Honorable Chris Bariomunsi. He's a member of parliament for Chinchizi County East, so to speak. And together with these two gentlemen is Mr. Andrew Mwenda, seasoned journalist, and also Entrepreneur. I'll start with you, the journalist, who should be able to at least break the ice this evening. 
At the dawn of independence, Uganda had far less money but delivered much more with regard to the public good. Today, 50 years down the road, we have a lot more money and delivered a lot less. Why that disconnect? Well, first of all, I disagree with your introductory statement that privatization and decentralization have delivered nothing in terms of the public Not good. Not much. I should word. tell you that actually the best decision the government of Uganda was to divest itself of doing business. If you look at privatized enterprises, most of them, not the, all of them, but most of them are performing very well. Whether you look at Stanbic Bank, Sheraton and Nile Hotels, whether you look at uh, Uganda Breweries, uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi Cola, all these were owned by the government of Uganda to a significant degree. Mm -hmm. Once government of Uganda divested its shares in banks like Barclays Bank, these banks have been taken over by the private sector. They have innovated new products. They have employed technologies. They have uh, uh, retooled themselves in terms of human skill. And right now, if you look at 1996, the total profits in the banking sector was 10 billion. This year, it's above 300 billion. Now, that's a humongous achievement, actually more than 400 billion in 2012, bank profits in the banking sector alone. So privatization was very good. Decentralization is what has not been so good because it was uh, captured by democratic and electoral politics so that every village is increasingly becoming a district and that way a lot of resources are deployed to administrative costs rather than service delivery. Now, to answer your question, you see at the time of independence, Uganda inherited a very restricted service delivery infrastructure. I'll give you an example. For the whole of Kigezi, there was one hospital. The whole of Kigezi district, which is now Kanungu, Rukunjiri, Kisor, and Kabale. For the whole of uh, Ankole, which is now about 11 or 12 districts, there was only one government hospital. So after independence, the first thing that the government of Milton Obote, UPC government under Milton Obote, tried to do is to rapidly elaborate the public goods and services being provided by the state, secondary schools, hospitals, etc., and roads. The problem is that building institutions and set capacity is a struggle of generational time. And yet the elaboration of these services or the expansion of these services took place in a period of only eight years. So what happened immediately after independence and even under NRM is that you had a, a very high rate of growth in the provision of services without an accompanying growth in the quality of skills and capacity of the state. So the state became overdeveloped in function, but underdeveloped in capacity. Its reach was beyond its grasp. And that is what has created the mismatch between what we have and what we are able to deliver. To join in there, Godba, as a researcher, what makes government unable to be a good business practitioner? Uh, I would agree with Andrew that uh, uh, that privatization was actually a good policy. I think uh, governments have no business doing a business mm -hmm. that can be done by the private sector. Uh, I, I would want to, uh, to probably articulate a different point that in my view, privatization, there are certain core functions of government, there are certain core utilities of government that I think the state must remain substantially engaged in one way or the other. So, um, electricity, uh, communication, um, um, roads, banking, that's, you know, the, the roads, that, that's infrastructure, the government has to be engaged, but these three utilities, the government must remain active in the marketplace to be able to provide direction and correct any market failures. Now, the, I think the, the, the challenge we had with our privatization is that we went uh, what I always call market fundamentalism. You, you just say the market will fix everything, so we are out of there. So I think that was uh, uh, mistake number one. Uh, mistake num uh, I think mistake, mistake number two is that uh, governments actually run businesses but the quality of government matters. Because we know that uh, in, in countries like China, which we are, some of the countries we, we aspire to, to be like, uh, governments run businesses. So our problem, in my view, was more about the problem of the quality of the governments that we've had, rather than the fact that government can't do anything. Chris Mariumus, he has a doctor, a legislator, and also someone that's worked with the international community as an advisor. Let's look at the specific um, delivery of a certain good called health services, where you are very conversant. Uganda's healthcare system is sick. What makes it sick? The, well, before I go to the health sector, basically if you trace back say, 50 years since independence, 
we've had a lot of ups and downs, especially because of the politics. And therefore, when the NRM government came into place, it inherited a state which had more or less collapsed, and it has engaged in rehabilitation and reconstruction of the state. And therefore, we need to appreciate the background that we have had since 1962 at Independence Time. Yes, there have been achievements. We cannot say that the privatization and the decentralization policies have failed or have not delivered much. I think one of the challenges has been that the, when we took on decentralization, we over decentralized it. When we had little capacity in the local governments. And that's why, at some point, we've had to review some of the decisions which had been taken, like the chief administrative officers who were initially decentralized, now were brought back to the center. There are also arguments that some heads of departments, like heads of health services, heads of education, should be brought back to the center. So in my view, when decentralization was introduced, I think we rushed to over-decentralize and we took many of the functions to the districts, and yet there was little capacity to undertake some of those responsibilities. But by and large, I think there have <coughs> been achievements here and there. Well, coming to the health sector, mm. there have been some achievements because when you look at some of the health outcomes, I think there are areas where we have made progress, like immunization, like uh, reduction of infant and child mortality, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, mobility rates, where well, some areas like maternal mortality ratio has not significantly improved, but the access to drugs and medicines, I think, has improved. So it's uh, a mixed green. In some areas, there have been reasonable improvements. In some others, uh, we haven't maybe achieved much. And there are several reasons. One of the key issues which we must look at is that the, over time, we've had a rapid population growth in Uganda. Which some that leaders have argued is a very positive thing to do. A big population is a great population. No, I don't agree with them because you see the demography, we say the population growth should be maybe three times less the economic growth. But when you look at what is pertaining in Uganda, we have a population growth rate of about 3.4 percent per annum and the economy is growing at almost the same level. And therefore, the population growth rate is not sustainable in Uganda. At Independence, we were about maybe 9 million Ugandans. Now you talk of 34 million Ugandans. Yeah, 7 million. Yes, about 7 million at Independence. And uh, we are not investing as much in our economy, <coughs> in the population, to turn around the quality of this population to make it productive. That's why even when we increase the budget for health, for instance, it is still a drop in the ocean. It's still a drop in the ocean. The drugs down to when they hear, uh, don't you think that the issues Chris has raised are known to government? And Chris is part of government. He is in the legislature. Godba has raised very important issues that regard. What makes government unable to realize this demographic uh, situation and turn them for the better of Ugandans? If you asked me from my anecdotal observation, the quality of public health care in Uganda is disastrous. But I always don't depend on my personal idiosyncrasies and biases. Mm -hmm. When I look at scientific research, and this is what Dr. Chris Barriumus was talking about, when you look at scientific research, the quality of healthcare delivery in Uganda is actually imp improving. Even when you look at Afrobarometer surveys, and this is a surprising thing, in 2010 and 2011 Afrobarometer surveys, 51% of the people are saying healthcare delivery in Uganda is good or fairly good, meaning 49 were saying it's bad. But 78% were saying, that it is improving. Now, I've, I am slightly reluctant as an individual to say that the citizen, 78% who said the overall trajectory, the direction, is that these services are improving, are being stupid. Do you see? I am much more inclined to believe a scientific opinion poll where citizens are showing greater confidence in the capacity of public institutions to improve the quality of healthcare delivery. But these are the various we are talking about. Because I've been pondering it in my mind. I think that the, because of increased education and incomes and increased access to communication instruments, we are able to see better things. Me and Godib have traveled all over the world. We have seen better things. So our expectations have grown faster than the capacity of our society to deliver on what we expect. 
so that I'll give you an example in economics. Just two of you. you uh, no, what I'm, I'm saying. Squeeze. But I'm even about the bulk of Ugandans. Yes, the bulk of Ugandans. Can I tell you? I was I was fact, surprised. The people watching us on television mm. are the minority of Ugandans because actually that's not true. Empirical mm. research mm. Yeah. about five percent of Ugandans have access to TV. No, and even less are, percentage have totally totally access <laughs> to but, electricity. But, but, but listen, but listen to this. In fact, this is the statistic. More Ugandans have access to radio today. We, uh, we have about we have about two million television sets in this country. If we have two million and you prospect that an average home in Uganda has six people, it is two million times six, mm -hmm. which gives you twelve million having access to television. By the way, in Uganda, given that people watch television in groups, it's very likely that you have about half the population of this country watching TV. That is why a lot of advertising is shifting towards television, precisely because it has a large audience. But I wanted to make the my guy point. Who's watching us alone in his room is saying huge group. Uh, uh, yes, but that is a <laughs> single person. You let, let, let me just finish the point I was trying to make. The point I was trying to make is that there is something we call the comparison group. You see, if if Simon, you were earning ten thousand dollars per month, and I was earning twenty thousand, I was earning double your money. If your income increases to forty thousand and mine increases to one million, I have leapfrogged you highly you may begin to feel poorer than you were, although your, your absolute income has increased four times, but because mine has increased 150 uh, times, the, the gap between me and you will make you feel possible you are, you are being left behind. In economics, we call it assessment by comparison group. Your comparison group may force you to think you are worse off even when, in absolute terms, you are better off. Please, God, but tell us, are Ugandans suffering from relative <laughs> po uh, poverty, like the word Andrew spoke exactly. about, yeah. or they yeah. are suffering from abject no, poverty I that mean, is actually uh, real, I mean, uh, as, as a result of the failure of government to deliver on the public? No, to be honest, uh, as a policy analyst, I always uh, want to convince myself that some of the aggregate statistics and indicators we use actually are scientific enough and they can tell us the true story of what's happening. However. Now, however, as someone who comes from, who travels all over Uganda, comes from a rural area, I find myself actually compelled to believe, to believe more in the anecdotal evidence. Uh, because uh, I come from Ntungam. I go to Itojo Hospital. And I lived in, it, I, I lived in Ntungamo. And uh, in the 70s, uh, the, the bad days of Idi Amin, uh, the, your life, if you are sick, the difference between you living and dying was getting to Itojo Hospital. So if they could get you on the street and you go to Itojo Hospital, you would go there, you are registered, you see a medical assistant. If you are sent to the lab, the, the lab technician is there, you, you get prescription, you go to the pharmacy and get medicine. Now, you, uh, I just passed Itojo Hospital just about two or three I weeks ago. I visited Itojo Hospital in 2010, in yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, I looked at the hospital. I'm like, okay, this hospital actually looks sick. Uh, then, then I go to the schools. And uh, I, I, got, uh, I got to my village. The, the I visited his primary school with the him. The classroom block, the classroom block wh where I attended my primary one to six. Uh, built by the Seventh Day Adventist Church. In, in 1979, when I left, the, the cement floor had collapsed. So we used to smear with cow dung to stop the jiggers. Uh, uh, up to now, the kids study in the same classroom block. And they're uh, using the same cow dung to stop the same jiggers. Yeah, I, I, if they are lucky to get cow dung, because now they may not even have the cows. That is keeping but well is, uh, with but the tradition. So, <laughs> and, and you see, <laughs> and you see Simon, no you see Simon, you could say this is isolated. So you go one kilometer, towards Ntungamo town, you find Nyashanga Primary School. It's the same story. You go one kilometer or two kilometers towards Itojo, Itojo oh. Hospital, you find Mpanga SDA Primary School. It's the same story. So then I keep on asking myself, so how do you compare this anecdotal evidence with the, the, with the aggregates, uh, uh, ag aggregate, uh, uh, or the rosy results that come the, from the results the that are coming out. So it's really, I think we need to be honest to ourselves that in as much as that at the aggregate level you can get these, uh, these pos uh, positive uh, 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 figures, um, for me, I'm interested in a kid uh, somewhere in, in, a, in a rural village in Uganda, the quality of education that kid gets. I'm interested in a pregnant woman going to hospital, being attended to, and, and, uh, and is not dying out of preventable diseases. So, so the statistics are okay, and we are all researchers. We need to be able to focus on them, but we have to be able to interpret them with the reality on the ground. Chris, how then do we move as a government from the rosy you know, uh, figures compared to the actual bad situation anecdotally gathered, as they say, mm. so that we have both matching? And having the same kind of effect to our eyes. Mm. Yeah, you see, somebody defined the statistics 
as when you have your head in an oven and your feet in the freezer. <laughs> So you are those are averages. And when you get an average, you are a bit warm. <laughs> <You're laughs> <You're laughs> <absolutely. laughs> you see, when you look at the poverty, for instance, it's true, the figures show that the proportion of those who are living in the abject poverty has been coming down. Statistically, you can say, yes, there are improvements. But because of the rapid and the sustainable population the growth rate in Uganda, the number of people who are in abject poverty is increasing. That's why when you go to the village, the people you see with the naked eye are getting more who are in poverty. That's the contradiction with respect to poverty. And my question is, how do we get out of that situation? How do we get government working? Because this show, turning around Uganda, is supposed to provide solutions. Yes, you know, to sit here and whinge about then, whatever the, Uganda is. The other issue I just wanted to raise is that the, the NRM government has invested in the mass access services. Like mass access to health services, universal primary universal education, universal primary education, universal secondary education. and uh, that in the initial stages did not address issues of quality. And I think the next stage is to look at, yes, there are many children who are accessing primary education, but they are not passing. And therefore we must now concentrate on the quality, look at the salaries of teachers, look at the classrooms, look at the space for, for teaching, so that we can get better at quality education which we are lacking. But I think the government has scored in terms of enabling children access education, uh, ensuring that they are health services. Because while you are saying the past governments we had the Tojo Hospital, I think progressively we have had lower level health centers, health center fours, health center threes, health center twos. But the question is, how can we make them functional so that they can be able to deliver a better health service? And one of the areas which has to be looked at is the issue of the health workers investing in the human resource. Because you wouldn't have missed that one, Chris. Huh? <laughs> 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 yeah. Because you go to the Tojo Hospital, but unless you have doctors and nurses and midwives provide the service, then it remains just a building. To bounce it off the issue of can, privatization, can that, Andrew, yes. and, and to relate Simon, it with that. Can I come to the anecdotal evidence yes. of mm. what I was saying about? First, I am disinclined to agree with Godba because you see I've traveled across the country from Gulu to Karamoja, from uh, Rukunjiri to Kanungu, me and Godba, Godba. to Hoima, to Masint, yes. everywhere I've gone with yeah. you. We have been to Teso together from Kumi to Mbale, me and Godba. Let me tell you one of the things I observe. A, in the 1980s and 90s, you could find many youth in rural areas riding uh, wooden bicycles. Now you find them on border borders. That's a transformation achievement. And many people... Post. That we'll discuss. Later. Yes, but, yeah. but, but you yeah, see, secondly, to explain a fact is not alter it. Yeah. Even this government, I am very critical of this government, but one of the things I note is that there have been a lot of investment in construction of primary schools. I've been to Godba's primary school. It is as it was in 1975. There I agree with him. We've However, been together to Itojo, and the hospital is a pale shadow of what it was in 1968 when Obote built it. But what uh, Bariomus is saying, government has built uh, health center two, three, and four which have taken services closer to people. Now, of course, when you rapidly elaborate services or expand access to services, the first casualty will be quality. Now, at least we are no longer debating uh, whether people can access health services. We can debate the quality of those services. When I was going to Makere University in 1993, you were not yet born, Simon. The challenge was <laughs> not passing the exam. The on this <laughs> uh, 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 listen, Simon, the challenge for us to go to Makere University was not passing the exam and getting the right principal passes. It was whether you could be admitted to university at all because the university places were 2,500. Today, there are about 30,000 admissions per year. So what, has, what we have achieved as a country is the elaboration of access, whether it is to health, to primary education, to secondary education, and to university education. The third, by the way, has been liberalization of education. Those days, you could only go to government schools. Right now, in secondary schools, you have 6,000 secondary schools in Uganda, actually 5,600. Government owns 1,600. The, the story private would sector, 4,000. Yes. Because the so, private sector so has I, done so much. Yes, but the point I want to underlie, the, the point I want to underlie, Simon, is that you cannot change a country, whether you are in government or opposition, whether in civil society or in a military society or political society, without identifying the strengths and achievements you have realized and motivate people around those achievements to do better. Part of the problem with the debate in Uganda is we are so self-defeatist. We keep m mourning and agonizing rather than saying what have we achieved as a people and as a country and, I think and how take, do we build on I that? I will take mm. even beyond what you are saying and mm. saying what can we do, not what mm. have we achieved, but what mm. can we do going forward. And with that, we come to the end of this first segment of Turning Around Uganda, the Alternative Policy Series. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us.
dedicated to bringing you the truth every day. Welcome back. You're still watching Turning Around Uganda, the alternative policy series, and my name is Simon Kasiate. Just before we went in for a break, we were, you know, talking about the usual problems that you and I face on a daily with regard to the delivery of a public good. But the question to the three distinguished gentlemen in the studio this evening, Andrew Mwenda, God Batumushabe, and Dr. Chris Bayumusi, is how then do we get out of this dire situation? Because clearly, in as much as there's been some improvement, there is a lot of Ugandans who believe that the improvement is not significant enough to reflect where Uganda should be at this point in time. So what is the alternative policy that we can do? For example, in health, in the delivery of, the, you know, of health, what can Ugandans or the government of Ugandans do that would change the tide? Delivery of education. How can we ensure that we have quality education beyond the quantity that we already enjoy? What can we do to ensure that we have good infrastructure that deliver some of this good to the Ugandans? I'll start with you, Chris, by your Can we say, for example, in the health sector, that we get a successful private individual like Dr. Ian Clark, who has done tremendously in terms of his one or two, you know, group of hospitals, and say, take over all the hospitals of uh, West Nile, we'll supervise you, but we'll ensure that you give the same quality as you give to IHK in Kampala. Well, privatization is a good policy, but I think also there are some areas where government should strategically remain the key player. I wouldn't recommend really that kind of extreme privatization. No one is asking government to privatize the army. You were just talking about the health care. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I am willing to buy the <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm saying <laughs> health care <laughs> is one of the key areas <laughs> which government should still control, mm -hmm. but probably should interrogate some of the policies and improve some of the areas. because. If you put healthcare in the hands of a private entrepreneur, it's going to be expensive, and Ugandans may fail to afford the best health services, and that can be a big challenge. Perhaps uh, they say we are putting a cap to that, that you will not go beyond this pay because government is subsidizing actually, the cost. Actually, we can yeah. do a solution like this. Mm -hmm. First, what if you look at the government of Uganda and the way it behaves, is that the, our government has achieved what I would call allocative efficiency in the sense that whenever a problem is identified, whether it's energy, roads, or, uh, or infrastructure, or schools, we are able to increase the funding. What our government has failed to achieve is what you'd call implementation efficiency and effectiveness. Now, once money is released, you have people like Kazinda and Obey who can easily steal it and does not reach the intended beneficiary. So if we have achieved allocative efficiency, but we have poor implementation efficiency, how do we resolve that? I would agree with you, Simon A, that wherever it is possible, because certain areas, the private sector may not be interested, but wherever it's possible, all our schools and the health centers should be privatized. Now, the government should not get out of provision of, uh, uh, rather, in, uh, should not get out of health and education. No, it, sh it should change the mode of its intervention. Rather than combine provision of the service with financing, the government can remain at the level of financing, financing. but divest itself of provision. So that if Simon Kasiat, who is a poor person, is going to a clinic owned by Andrew Mwenda, the government can give a voucher to Simon Kasiate, and that voucher can be cashed by the clinic once Kasiate has gotten a service. Where has that worked, Andrew? Well, first of all, Are we going to a, 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 a voucher system. They have, they have been debating it in the United States. 
I will, I'm very suspicious that there are many countries where governments give vouchers for people to be able to access a service. The problem for Uganda right now is we need a mindset change. We believe that for government to uh, finance a service, it must also provide it. And I am saying it's already happening now with secondary schools. Let me show you what is happening with USE. In USE, if you go to a private school, you see there are certain areas of Uganda where government wants to finance secondary education, universal secondary education, but okay. the government does not have a school. So the government has to pay a private school. Now, this is what is happening. When you are in a, a government school, the government pays teacher salaries, buys chalk, sends capitation grant, builds the classrooms, buys the land. When you go to a private school, all those costs are met by the private investor. However, mm -hmm. in a government school, the government sends a capitation grant of $41,000 per term to service at student. $41,000? Yeah. Uh, 41,000 shillings per term 41, in a government school. In a private school, government pays only about 53,000. The difference is 12,000. But listen to this, uh, Simon. For a difference of 12,000, an investor buys land, builds classrooms, buys desks, pays teachers, does every single thing. It's cheaper for government to provide education through the private sector, as it is doing right now, than through government schools. So we need to separate the financing of public services from their provision. Let them be provided by the private sector, but financed by the government to those who cannot afford. God, by your noting in approval, does this sound no, like no, magic no, to your ears? No, no, I want to talk, uh, just two quick points. One is, uh, is uh, I think Andrew talked about implementation efficiency. There is also uh, the whole issue of policy, failures, and reversals. Mm. You see, in, in the crisis that we had in the, 17s, in the 70s and 80s, kids who went to school, uh, got a certain quality of education, could read and write, could pass in grade one. And one of the, one of the interventions then was the Parents Teachers Association. So the parents, realizing the failures in the education system, came together, they would, they would subsidize uh, payment of salaries for teachers. They would contribute money to build infrastructure. Government came in and said, no PTAs, we are introducing something called uh, school management committees. And really, the, most of the studies that have, taken, that have uh, been undertaken show that these man school management committees are not working very well. And the, the point I wanted to emphasize is that most of the things that government is trying to do are supply driven. They are not demand driven. Uh, and I can give this, uh, another example, which is in the road sector. Uh, government privatized the, 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 the construction and maintenance of roads. Mm -hmm. Now, many actors, many people moved, in, moved into this industry, bought road equipment. And, they, and, and I think the, uh, the entrepreneurs in the road sector have been growing. Now, all of a sudden, government comes in and says, no, we are going to do roads ourselves. So you supply road equipment to districts. So what is going to happen? with this capacity that has been the built in the, the private, private sector. sector. So you, you basically you have a policy reversal there that ends up actually undermining the delivery of public services. Now, one, one of the proposals I wanted to give... private yeah. enterprises because yeah, you see course. they invested. Yeah. Yeah. Because they invested when yeah, you lack policy uh -huh. consistency, you yes. inflict heavy costs in the private sector. Yeah. You're Absolutely. very right. But now, Chris, yeah. uh, no, I, I wanted to just come in and give one proposal. You have a minute. Uh, um, maybe I should postpone it because uh, I think it's important. I'll be glad if you if you did propose it here now. No, but because uh, we've been doing studies in 26 districts across this country, and uh, we look at the budgets of districts, we found that uh, for all the 26 districts, over 40 percent of their budgets is spent on education. Uh, between 20 to 25 percent of their budgets is spent on uh, on uh, on healthcare. That means, uh, and I was looking at the leader budget this morning, so there is 8% eight, uh, eight, uh, uh, 8 being spent on agriculture, 2% being spent on natural resources. But these are the core uh, businesses, the core assets of the districts. And my point has been that if government really wants to, imp to change the way we are running the economy, that we should get these districts that we've created all over the place, and try to organize them into production units, and we give money to these chairpersons and the cows and whatever, and say, what is the output you are going to give us? Because, because we've given you this beyond the districts. They, we've had President Museveni taunting us that every family must be a production unit, so it's no. going down to family level. Then no, there's a difference be between talking and doing <laughs> things. <laughs> Chris, you interact with Ugandans, and they, they are the bulk of your voters, ordinary people as it gets. Do you think there is something that an ordinary Ugandan can do at individual capacity that would then, through a multiplier effect, help 
us get out of the kind of abyss we are in today. You see, one of the challenges we have had, like the education sector, is the way government has communicated the education policy. Because you see government officials say, we have UPE, universal primary education, and it is free, and entirely free. And then the parents and members of the communities think the children belong to government, the schools belong to government, and it has become very difficult so for us. is to sire and send. Uh, absolutely. It becomes very difficult for us, even the political leaders, to mobilize the communities, to mobilize the parents, to make a contribution. Even when the UPE and USE law that we put in the place of the parliament really provides for parents to, for instance, buy uniform, buy food, give food to the children, the way government has communicated that policy has actually confused the public. And therefore, there is a need for better articulation of what the intentions of the government are so that we can mobilize the communities to participate in some of these programs. If you look at the health sector, for instance, government already is implementing the public-private partnership. Yes. Coming back to the issue of privatization, where government uh, extends regular grants to public not-for-profit hospitals, these mission hospitals. Mm -hmm. But there is no clear evidence that services have become more affordable and more accessible in these private not-for-profit hospitals where government gives subventions. How about in the cases where there is a build, operate, and then transfer, where you say, Chris, build this hospital in Chisizi, mm -hmm. operate it for 10 years, but afterwards, transfer it back to government. Hasn't that worked in some cases? Uh, or wouldn't it work? Well, it could work, but I think we have to go gradually because the problem of putting some of these essential services in the hands of the private people entirely is that some of them are capitalists. They will want to scoop a lot, scoop a lot of profits, and, run and that could be at the disadvantage of the poor people who cannot afford. When we so started this show, Chris, you decreed the population increase vis-a-vis yes. -vis the economic growth of this country. Yes. What is the role of an ordinary Ugandan with regard to the contribution to this uh, uh, exponential population growth? And I really want to use that word exponential because I know that in the next 20 years we will be getting closer to over 50 million Ugandans. Mm -hmm. Already we are unable to fend for the 34 million, so to speak. How shall we be able in the next but Simon, less than I a decade? Thought, I yes, thought, yes. But first of all, Simon yes. is a hypocrite. He yes. has been calling me and he, say, he has been denouncing gays, saying yes. they, they are going to make, make Uganda get extinct. <laughs> if you don't want the population to grow, possibly you encourage gay rights <laughs> no, no, so no, that no, no, no. people stop producing. <laughs> Why? I will what? use my discretion no, as well <laughs> <of> this program <laughs> to, <laughs> treat, <laughs> to treat your comment with the contempt it deserves <laughs> because <laughs> it is a versionary, <laughs> angering and causing no, the viewers no, odium. Chris, but you are saying that you don't want to he, he, every day he calls me saying we must be producing children. Yeah. Now here he's saying we should not be producing children. Shall you ignore my private discussion with Mwen <laughs> for yeah. the sake of the <laughs> viewers that are yes. enjoying yeah. this very emotive and intellectual discourse? You see, the rapid the population growth of Uganda is, is driven by fertility. Basically, we have highly fertile Ugandan women. Or perhaps uh, active adult well. males and women. <laughs> uh, of course, the fertility <laughs> of the women yeah. is influenced by, by the men. Yeah. And uh, the statistics we have show that averagely a Ugandan woman produces seven children in her lifetime, and that's quite high. And uh, there is a medicine for that, basically is to promote family planning so that individuals, couples, and partners can produce by choice, not by chance. And the challenge we have had is the mixed uh, policy communication from the political leaders. Some of us say we should promote Huge population. A, a manageable family size. Mm -hmm. Others say, produce until you exhaust your biological potential, government will provide the services. Market. And we need markets because yeah. the more the people like China, the bigger the market. Yeah, but the, the population which cannot buy a safety pin. <laughs> yes, the market is needed, but it should be a quality population. So yeah. really we must have a unified message from the political leadership on the question of manageable family size in Uganda so that we can mobilize people to know that's what the matter of producing children the way you want. You must limit the number of children that you can afford. I am forgetting the presence of uh, forgetting so, for, for, to, uh, for, uh, forget the presence of Christopher Yumuzi here. Yeah, you yes. look into the camera, God, but as a researcher yeah. and tell the government of Uganda mm. what it can do, a quick mm. fix mm. that will possibly change the tide and make it a good government that delivers the public good that its citizens mm. are at least living an yeah. averagely well or better life than they are living today. Uh, no, first of all, I, I just want to make a quick comment on uh, what you have been accused 
off by Chris and Andrew, which which I'm always accused of. That when Would we you? when we when we talk about things that either government has not done properly or what it should be doing, then immediately it's like you are not recognizing the the achievements and the progress that we've been making. And I always keep on mentioning this point that no, the uh, when we talk about these things, it's really not to say government you've done nothing. I, I think for me there must be a sense of urgency because when the healthcare system is not working. Uh, uh, 16 women die, give, be, uh, 20, yeah, 26 women die, die give, giving birth. Uh, there is a child dying somewhere in a hospital. There is a school, a, a kid who is going to school and is not getting a quality education. So I, I want us to feel <coughs> a sense of urgency and therefore we should not go into the comfort Maybe of what we dying be. women every day is not big enough to create such an no, 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 Maybe no, one I, child failing to get a quality education is not big enough to create the urgency. And Who knows? Yes, and, and I'm, no, I'm saying, are, and, and I'm talking beings. to, yes, yes the, the these are not statistics. They are human beings. Yeah. So I'm saying people like Chris Bariumunsi, who, who, are, who are in a position of the decision making, of policy making, I, I want them to have that sense of urgency that we, they, you are dealing with a human being. It could be your kid, it could be your nephew, it could be someone. So I, I just wanted to, to uh, put that record straight. Secondly, well, it's, uh, what it's unlikely that it will be his kid or his yeah. nephew because I think yeah. he has distinguished himself mm -hmm. financially to ensure that his kid gets a better education. <laughs> okay. And I think therein lies the biggest okay. problem. It may be his the policy makers yeah. are detached, their experience is detached from I the ordinary Ugandans. That you, mm -hmm. God, by your children yeah. mm -hmm. would never, for example, mm -hmm. understand and appreciate the inside of a classroom like the one you went to school. Mm -hmm. Andrew, what now would you tell them to do that would change the type? You see, to know where you're going, you must know where you are. And if you all exaggerate that you are in a very worse situation, you tend to give people despair. People must be motivated to achieve. You must say, no, we have achieved this, but we can achieve much better mm -hmm. than we have achieved. Mm -hmm. And on the issue of population, by the way, I am a very strong believer that they should do, uh, our population should grow and grow rapidly. I should tell you this world will be inherited by the fertile. This world will be inherited by the fertile. You can read ancient civilizations, whether of Rome, Babylon, or Greece, you will discover that it is those who were able to produce children that survived. But let me come to the issue you raised. You see, you need to understand why the quality of delivery of public goods and services in Uganda is less than what we can achieve given A, the resources we have, B, the capacity that we have in terms of human skill. So Uganda is far punching far above its weight. The issue is the very specific way in which our electoral and democratic politics has evolved. Why? If you are President Yorim Seven leading NRM and you want to win elections in Fort Porto and you get Andrew Mwenda, Adolf Mwesigi, Tom Obutime, who are important and powerful pillars of public opinion there, and you appoint them to cabinet. The Batoro, out of ethnic solidarity, will say, our children are in power. Our people. We will vote for the government. If you get uh, Hilary Onek, you get uh, Richard Tadwong from Gulu and put them in your cabinet, again, the people in Gulu will say, our children are in positions of power, we will vote. Just like all of us black people support Obama, out of uh, uh, racial solidarity. I think that's right? a very sweeping statement. Well, I, I can mm. tell you that 90%, 91% in the last election of black people in America voted for Obama. If you ask what he did for them, you cannot find. But mm. racial solidarity, ethnic solidarity here. Let me tell you why it is very dangerous for public service delivery. If a ruling party or a president can win an election by appointing a few notables from a community hmm, in two positions of power and privilege, that is a much more cost-efficient and cost-effective strategy of winning votes than having to build roads, schools, and, and, and hospitals, and then build healthcare delivery systems because those they take more time, they take more is discipline, they take more money to deliver. Be that as so, it may so um, hold a second, hold a second. Mm. So we need to understand that the the uh, our a high incentive incapacity. The yes, there is greater incentive for, for trading in political patronage mm -hmm. as a vehicle for regime legitimacy and elect and building electoral coalitions. There is a greater incentive for that than the incentive of building public institutions and promoting. Uh, rather building po political institutions and building public policies that can deliver public goods and services to yeah, people. Yeah, be that as it may, the question is, should we continue that vicious cycle of politicians just taking us But, right? but I do not can know whether you that? follow democratic politics. There is a gun debate. People are dying in America every day out of shooting. If you take this issue to the Congress, Obama was giving a set of the national address today, and the entire debate is, it is so difficult to get things through a democracy because in a democracy you need to get votes, and votes may not necessarily go to the right decision, but to those who are able to mobilize public opinion. Now, if you can easily organize public opinion on the basis of ethnicity, that is why if you go to ethnically diverse communities and societies, 
whether democratic or not, you find that the delivery of public goods and services is always correspondingly poor. The more homogeneous a society is now, the, ha the, the better the service, sa the service delivery. To improve service delivery in Uganda, One. A, we need first of all to look at it as an evolutionary rather than a revolutionary process. And I can tell you with growing incomes, with growing urbanization and growing education, mm -hmm. the constituencies that are demanding better government are growing. So the social infrastructure mm -hmm. for better government is growing every day. And I can postulate that in the next 30, 40 years, if we sustain the current progress, mm -hmm. we'll be able to arrive where possibly England was in 1960. B, I think that what you need in this country is the leadership. When I was growing up, I saw leaders. Uh, a sub-county chief would come to our village and uh, the, the, rules, the, hygiene, the rules of hygiene would say, you have to, the, the local bylaws would must say, have you must have a toilet, <laughs> you must have uh, a katandaro, you must have a granary. And the sub-county chief would come to visit, to inspect, and every household would invest in making sure that it has organized itself. So what do we have in Chris Mayumu? That's called MPs? leadership. What do we have in uh, RDCs? What do we have in ministers? What do we have in this plethora of presidential yes. systems? <laughs> those, those do we just leaders, have backing yeah. dogs? Or those are rulers, <laughs> something else. No, but but you see, Chris, uh, what, as we, as we uh, close yeah, here, yeah. Okay. the politicians seem to be taking the blunt that you are you are the ones who should be taking us forward, mm. but you seem to be the ones dragging us behind because you have to balance between delivering the public good and sustaining yourself in those very wonderful offices called well, First of all, there is no alternative to democracy. Simon, maybe Chris could and also comment on this. When yes. a motion comes to parliament, yes. and you've already talked about these districts we've created that, uh, co that comprise nothing. Mm. When a, mo a motion comes to parliament, it, it is required of a leader. You provide leadership. Mm. You don't come to us and say, oh, the people of Chihi have said they want a district, so we give them. That's not leadership. But and when you say, area is to deliver uh, on the you, and fancy and when you say, of, of that's Chihi. And, and, when you, and, and that's what democracy say. demands. No, no, it's no, not no, about no. how reasonable an idea is, no. but how wide Spread, it Simon, is that is called a failure of leadership. Mm. It's not what democracy Or maybe demands. you may need to educate the viewers who have mm. not been uh, part of our political processes and God, but be very exact. <laughs> that that's not the way democracy and politics work. Andrew, I beg to cut you out. Uh, Chris. God, God Bahia misses democracy. I can tell you, you should follow the civil rights movement. Yeah. From 1950, the civil rights movement is launched. It took America as a democratic system. 15 years to pass civil rights legislation. People demonstrated on the streets, people, d presidents who supported civil rights legislation could not go it through because they needed to get to win over people and get votes. And I'll give you another example. The, the desire to end slavery in America's democratic system failed. The democratic system failed to end slavery. A civil war ended slavery in America. War ended slavery. The democratic system failed. Democracy does not always give you what you want because democracy requires compromise, requires consensus, requires electoral majorities, and building electoral majorities requires making you many unprincipled compromises sometimes. You're looking at Andrew with a lot of pain and shock. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> that just looks academic. Like yeah, yeah, it's textbook <laughs> material. <laughs> but I want to say there is no alternative to democracy. Mm, Where we yeah. have reached, what we need to do is strengthen our democratic processes to ensure that we produce the leaders who are effective, leaders who listen to the people, but at the same time who don't take just whimsical decisions like uh, you are saying. You are talking about leaders, how about the citizens? There is a need to elevate the quality of the citizens because there is people who say that we get the leaders that we deserve as a people. These leaders are not cut out from a strange I stock. Like they are from one of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are right, but uh, I agree with God that when you are in a position of leadership, much as, yes, you want to appease the population, you must do, take the right decisions. For instance, if but there is a yeah, demand... I agree with Chris. Chris if, if Chris were to lead in this country, mm. he would not be part of NRM with its corruption and incompetence. But he knows the practical politics of Kanung cannot allow him to stand on an FDC ticket or any other ticket and win. And that's why I'm is saying that, that democracy, no. democracy imposes very many serious so you're constraints on you. the practical politics of Kanung is what constitutes uh, democracy. No, democracy. what I'm saying is so that he recognizes so there are many MPs from Western Uganda who recognize that to win an election... <laughs> what are you he saying? doesn't. <laughs> Let me tell you. One second, each of us. Yes, let me tell you this. After I all this has been said and done, you know, after, uh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. If after all this has been said and done, mm. do you actually think that there will be a time where we'll say enough is enough, we are moving forward to deliver the public good as it should be, and that this country is moving forward? Simon, the Given point is, the current say, political yes, Simon, situation. the leaders yes, no. of Uganda do not come from Kenya, they do not come from Norway. They are offshoots of this society. Absolutely. They reflect the weaknesses, idiosyncrasies, and all sorts of strengths of this society. That is one. So, the leaders cannot do what is not part of them as products of this society. Two, the vast majority of MPs of the NRM from Western Uganda, you talk to them. 
they will agree with VCJ on 90% of the points. They will not join his party. Why? Because they understand that NRM is very strong on the ground. If they cross, they would lose their constituencies. So the practical application of democratic politics is, mm, let me stay with NRM yeah, even if I disagree yeah, in order for me to be able to achieve... You, you can, can reform, reform NRM from within. Oh, 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 yes. Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's a democratic exactly. compromise. In other words, what I'm saying is, mm. even Bariomus himself in making choices, he cannot say he can lead. First of all, a leader must move with your people. If you travel 20 kilometers ahead of them, then you have lost your people. You must ensure that you are with them. And that compromise is, let me stay in NRM and achieve minimal reforms inside NRM than leaving it and going to the political wilderness and losing my parliamentary seat. You make that compromise, even Museven makes that compromise when he realizes there are too many pressures for districts from clans and the tribes and families. And then he also concedes because a, a democratic process becomes very difficult to achieve uh, consensus and decisions. Chris, do you think that if we have new leadership at the helm of this country, perhaps what we clamor for can come to pass? I think what is important is to invest in the civic competence of Ugandans so that every five years when we go for elections, they can elect a leader of their choice. Not necessarily changing an MP from myself to, to, to Bodiba, but for people to evaluate us and be able to vote the best so that we can and be able to... questions. Absolutely. That is indeed what it means to turn around Uganda, doing things that we have not been doing in the past and doing them rightly to turn this country from the desperate situation that it seems to be in to that situation which I may call political or social bliss that we all would want and clamor for in this country. You're watching Turning Around Uganda. It's been a wonderful discussion with Andrew Mwenda, Godbert Mushab and Chris Bariumus. I want to thank you, Should gentlemen. I will uh, ignore the <laughs> egocentrism of Andrew Mwenda and thank you, our viewers, for staying with us this far. God bless.